Hello. Hello, everybody. You have us both here. I'm Natalie. This is Life After a Cult, where I talk about my 35 years in Scientology and share how I left with three generations of my family. And today I get to be here with Aaron. Hey, Aaron. Hey. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. So great to see everybody in the chat. Hello over there. Thank you so much for the members being here as well on both our channels. And I know that I would absolutely love it if you would go over and subscribe to my channel and hit that like button on your way in because rumor has it that it helps us with notifications. Rumor. And for the members on my channel, I just uploaded four emojis uh, courtesy of Marilyn Honig. So uh, check those out. Let me know if they're working. You guys know how to use the emojis more than I do. So apparently the emojis are a big deal. Oh. And so there's four custom ones there now. Nice. I want to see your emojis. I've been, I've had it on my to-do list. I want to add some emojis as well because it sounds like so much fun. I've only got a few, but I want to do more. Yeah. So what are we here to talk about today? Scientology's most scandalous scandals. Yes. Scandalous scandals. And I want to kind of preface a little bit of a trigger warning. Some of what we're going to go over is scandalous because it's dangerous and has resulted in loss of life when it comes to with Scientology. But it was very much, like I was saying to you, Aaron, a reminder for me of how important it is that we remember what Scientology is and what Scientology has done in the past and what's going on in the present. Because I uh, sometimes I feel, well, let me put it this way. I have had it very gently pointed out to me that Sometimes I will still, because I've normalized a lot of the abusive behavior in Scientology and the way they go at people, because I'm, I'm so used to that, that I've normalized it. And sometimes I need to take a step back and remind myself of a lot of the things that they've done and the scandalous and bizarre ways that even people have passed and remember that we are dealing with, you know, a human trafficking cult. Yeah. Totally. I mean, I think you gave an example before when we were chatting that um, you, you sort of realized that you had normalized people being followed. Like you're like, oh, well, yeah. they're just being followed, not a big deal. And someone had to point out to you like, that is not yeah. normal. Yeah, and, I had to point out. Yeah. <clears throat> and for me, I feel like there was a moment uh, a few years ago. And actually, this is one of the things every now and then I've mentioned this conversation that me and Serge and Nora had in Malibu some lunch that really changed my viewpoint on things. One of the things that came up was this idea of, of bull baiting and TR zero bull bait, particularly when it's done on young children, yeah. um, where you're training them that it's okay for people to do horrible things to you and for you not to react. Yep. Uh, and that normal, that normalizes people doing bad things to you. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and and the degree to which that kind of bull baiting, especially for me, especially when done as a young child, uh, trains you like that, like emotions are bad. Yes. <laughs> that you're not supposed to have emotion or show emotion and they're negative. And if you do have them, you need to suppress them because that's bad. Mm -hmm. And um, so that that's another way of, of a thing I had normalized. Because um, <clears throat> I think most Scientologists would probably be like, like if they heard, if they heard former Scientologists talking about how destructive TR0 and TR0 bull bit is, they'd be like, oh God, just a bunch of disaffected SPs spreading lies. And yeah. you go, it actually took me quite a while after leaving Scientology to understand the ways in which TR0 and TR0 bull bait are potentially and most often very destructive emotionally. Uh, so that's just an example I thought of from my from my background. You mentioned the, the thing about being followed. Yeah, I guess I've sort of normalized being followed as well or having PIs following yeah. you. Yeah, and I'm glad that somebody said something to me about that because I didn't realize that I was doing that. And it's not it, – it's, it, it's funny to me, but it's one of those funny but not funny kind of a things when you think like, oh, well, you know, what were you ever fair game by Scientology? And initially, I'm like, well, when I first left, I'm like, you know, not really. I mean, you know, I got followed by some PIs. So, no. <laughs> right. <laughs> that is being fair gamed. And it is not normal to be followed that's, by PIs or anyone. That's but a it, good one. 
Yeah. And I think, Erin, that's why sometimes I think we need to remind ourselves, especially growing up in Scientology and being around this and being being kind of like you get used to putting yourself out there and talking about Scientology in a very free way. That has been for me, the biggest thing I've gotten out of being on YouTube has been, I get to talk about Scientology however I want to, and I have no concern about it because I don't care what Scientology thinks about it. And I have a right to talk about it. And that's something that I think even in when people leave Scientology, for some time I've noticed that there's this thing where you still feel like you have to follow the first rule of Scientology which is don't talk about Scientology. <laughs> and that'll carry through sometimes. Did you feel right off the bat when you left? How long after you leave till you were actually speaking out? Because I feel too like you're a different carrot. Well, for me, because there was so many years of overlap of being under the radar yeah. and like secretly working with Mike Rinder um, and even at that time, Tony Ortega and, and Marty Rathman, that for me, there was just many years of overlap. Yeah. Um, where I was still technically not declared, but I was not in good standing, but I was not declared for a long time. Like even without being declared, I was banned from attending the golden age of tech two event. So oh. there's this weird uh, gray area, right? Where I was not in good standing, but I was not declared. And I was already sort of working with the big bad SPs. So that by the time I was officially declared, I was already out the door. Yeah. I'd been out the door mentally for years by that point. So I didn't have to get over, uh, oh, I can't talk about Scientology, but I was still very, very fixated on, oh, I have to be exceedingly fair, maybe even more fair than I uh, feel like I should be so that my message won't be uh, repulsive to Scientologists. And I think as more and more time went on, um, I still want my message to be acceptable to to. To people, I still want people who are in Scientology to hear to hear what I have to say and go, oh, he's being fair and, and accurate. Yeah. But I'm less concerned about continuing to be able to appeal to like an extremist Scientologist. Like what that's not yeah. who I'm trying to reach. That's not who I care about reaching, you know. And so I just became less fixated on it. Um, so like, you know, for now, I, I, I make fun of Scientology a lot more now than I did in my early videos, because in my earlier videos, I was very, very worried about offending Scientologists. Now I just, it's like, come on, half the Scientologists aren't really Scientologists anyway, and they think our videos are hilarious. So yeah, yeah, they do. And that's really an interesting point because you're right. It's just, it's, it's not going to be, you got to, it's kind of like knowing who your audience is and extremist Scientologists aren't that it's going to take so much more. Yeah. But what's so great is one of those, when one of those extremist Scientologists does leave and when we see that happen, it is outright, I think, shocking for so many people because it, it's just not the norm. And you're right. So many people who are still in good standing with Scientology are just phoning it in. And yeah. some are just kind of waiting to see what happens as they figure out their exit plan. Totally. So like I did an interview with someone just a couple nights ago um, who, uh, well, it was with Jenny and yeah. she'd done some videos on her own channel, but she'd never done anything with me before. And the next day she was like, oh my God number of messages I'm getting, like the number of under the radar Scientologists that watch your channel is unbelievable. <laughs> yeah. And I actually feel like if under the radar Scientologists who are still kind of like half in and half out, mm -hmm. if they think our content is good and interesting and awesome and funny, that's actually who I'm trying to reach. Yeah. Not the people who are still diehard true believers. I honestly don't care what those people think. Yeah. I do care what the under the radar people think though. Yeah, that's true. That's true. It is neat. It is neat to hear. I've talked about a few times in my morning recaps how there is such a larger number of people leaving Scientology and people under the radar who are coming forward where they're feeling they've been under the radar because they felt still more at like this effect point of Scientology. But through these videos speaking out and seeing the protesters, they feel more emboldened and it gives them strength and the courage to leave and leave with their head held high, you know, not just like whatever happened there, this power, right. it's so like the wizard of Oz. It's the, the, the house has fallen on the witch. Yeah. Now it's yeah. just a matter of people realizing that they always had the power to go home. <laughs> yeah.
There was another thing I realized, uh, I just remembered like that I was kind of holding on to, <clears throat> which is as a, as a Scientologist, the idea of being expelled from Scientology uh, or declared a suppressive person, same thing. It, there's a ton of shame associated with it. Yeah. A ton of shame. And so even if on some level you're like, I'm better off out of Scientology, there's still uh, potentially this, this shame attached to the fact that so many people you used to consider important now think you are shameful. Yeah. And it's hard not to onboard their projected shame. <laughs> yeah. It's hard not to carry that around, especially, and, and, and I'm mentioning that because I think that the very large community of very vocal, uh, public and vocal former Scientologists, I think helps ease that, that burden of carrying projected shame. Mm -hmm. There's something very obvious to compare it to, which is this awesome, successful, vibrant group of people who are not afraid of Scientology, are not ashamed of having been declared SP, um, mm -hmm. and clearly, you know, don't look like and act like big bad SPs, mm -hmm. uh, and, and aren't out here pretending to be perfect, you know? <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Quite the opposite. <laughs> yeah, quite, quite the opposite. Um, and that is something that I really, that, that is um, some value that I really hope what we're all doing here does. I, I, that's value that I hope what we're doing provides to people who are now under the radar for when the day comes that they're no longer under the radar. Yeah, I think it really does. That was one of the biggest, when I got to that point of fully letting go of what Scientology or Scientologists thought was so freeing because you you leave and you're no longer there's no longer somebody standing there who's threatening you or trying to hold something over your head but for me it took a while to kind of really shed away and realize that the only power they had is what i gave them because right. otherwise nobody cares <laughs> Right. Nobody cares. The things that they care about and they're hung up on and the things that they want to create these dead agent packs out of and say about people, whether it's true or it's not true, nobody cares. And the people who do care don't matter. That cliche saying is just so true. It just doesn't yeah. matter. <laughs> yeah. It's funny when you mention the question of, oh, are you being fair gamed? Because I have the same knee jerk response. No, not really. Yeah. <laughs> sure. There's a website dedicated to me <laughs> using my name. Like, AaronSmithLevin.com is like a hate website created by a multi-billion dollar international human trafficking cult. And then there's the private investigators, but no. Yeah, no. No. Nah. Yeah, not really. And then I'm always, I, I do always say, oh, there's nothing they can do to you. There's nothing they can do. And you go, but of course there's stuff they can do. I think what I, what I, for, what I, what I don't realize I actually mean is none of it works and you shouldn't let it bother you. But, but in a way I've sort of normalized the stuff that they do do because I poo poo it. Now I poo poo it for my own reasons. Um, mm -hmm. but it, it, but in a way it does normalize the stuff that they do do. Cause I almost act like they're not really doing it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And it also, it, it's just, they're kind of spinning their wheels to a degree. Cause some of the mm -hmm. things that they do when you talk about like when Poe on the go was in Clearwater and he shared about being, you know, followed around and it's kind of like, yeah, yeah, they're probably doing that. <laughs> it's almost like they're just this like annoying seasonal bug or something that comes up. But I think that's because we've dealt with so much in Scientology and out of Scientology as ex-Scientologists. And now as ex-Scientologists who every single day we get on YouTube and hand Scientology their ass. I mean, it, right. it's just, it's a different, it's, it, you become, I think it's much easier to look at it where it seems like such a smaller thing. But if you pull one of those things out, like, Po being followed, that is, you know, that, that is a thing. That's, that's not okay. Who does that? That is not churchy behavior at all. That's very culty, but ex right. expecting it, but it has no power. So we're, you know, not to tempt the fates or anything, but <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really look at everything we're doing and how long we've been doing it for and look what Scientology has been able to do about it. Yeah. Nothing. Yeah. Not even the arrests have worked. Not the, the attempts at restraining orders haven't worked. The the slash tires haven't worked. The keyed cars haven't worked. Good luck, guys. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make anyone less interested in doing this stuff. It makes a lot of people a lot more interested. Yeah. That is exactly what ends up happening is it just fuels the fire and people just more so want to expose Scientology. And in looking at some of the things we're going to talk about today, it's something that really reminded me 
of the importance of making sure people remember these stories and some of these bigger scandals because sometimes it's too easy to get caught up in the now, right? And just what's happening right now and forgetting that, hey, this is like, we're talking about even not that long ago, some of these things that have happened. When you think about, okay, well, you know, say like with Tom Cruise and Katie Holmes and when she left and the scandal that that created, was it really that big of a deal in terms of the effect on everyday Scientologists? Because Scientology had their narrative ready to go. <clears throat> and, you know, they were all on Team Tom Cruise and Katie Holmes was very quiet about it. And still to this day, hasn't really said anything about it. And it's been years. The biggest thing was probably with, you know, Leah Remini coming out and, and everything that happened at his wedding. That is definitely, I think, would be on, would be, at that time, like so scandalous. But when you compare these things, the celebrity stuff next to the non-celebrities that have been injured and hurt and the families that have been harmed and broken up, it's just such small potatoes next to that. Yeah. I agree. I agree. You want to kind of like, well, shall we jump into it here? Yeah, let's do it. All right, so we're going to go through a few oh, of see. the bigger scandals in Scientology. We are not, this is by no means a complete list because we just don't have that kind of time. It is an <clears throat> ongoing conversation. There are so many. What we did is just picked out a couple to kind of really bring to the forefront again the importance of exposing Scientology as a human trafficking cult that they are because one, for example, let's start with Whitney Mills. Aaron, I, re I remember you covering this. And for those that don't know, Whitney Mills was a 40-year-old Scientologist real estate agent. She had reached operating Thetan level eight. And she tried to set herself on fire and then pew pewed herself. And yeah, this is one of the most disturbing things um, I've ever covered. Yeah. in the world of Scientology. Um, <clears throat> and a common thread in a lot of these uh, hor horrific Scientology stories is how many of these incidents stem from Scientology's refusal to allow any of its members to get professional mental health care. Yeah. And their insistence that Scientology is the only thing that can actually fix, fix anyone's so-called mental health problems because Scientology doesn't even believe in mental health problems. They believe that it's your engrams and it's your body phaetons mm -hmm. and that the entire mental health field and, you know, biotech pharma field is just pure hogwash, fake science, just a tool of big psych to control and, you know, enslave civilization. And yet so many of their own members take either their own lives or other people's lives because of mental health care issues that go unresolved, unre un un unaddressed, and untreated. And Whitney Mills is one of those, one of the most disturbing cases of this I've ever heard of. Um, and because recent. it was, and it, and it was, rel it was relatively recent. And it was crystal clear that the Scientology officials who were responsible for dealing with her were completely aware of everything she was get running into and, and having trouble with. She was asking for help. Uh, they were so aware of it that at one point they literally encouraged her to take her own life and offered her assistance in doing so. Um, because why not just drop the body and pick up another body? Yeah. And it is so disgusting. Um, and there's probably even more I could do uh, additional info I could do videos about, but it's honestly, it's so difficult to do those videos. It it always stays pretty low on my list of videos every day to do. It is. It's difficult. And she, I mean, this happened, everybody who's watching, this happened in May of 2022. This yeah, was, this was not, less than two years ago. Yeah. This was not a long time ago, like some of the other ones that we're going to cover in Scientology history. This was in May of 2022, and she was known to be depressed. Scientology doesn't does not acknowledge depression. And like Aaron said, I remember when you covered it, it was known. She asked for help. She she did the things that a Scientologist would do, and she was not given that help. Yet she yeah. was being taken care of, you know, a la Lisa McPherson style 
with Scientology right. handlers who were supposed to be keeping an eye on her. And uh, yeah, it, yeah. It, it she was just, put, she was put under watch. She was really? being watched by Scientology staff members. Uh, daily reports were being sent into the director of processing at flag. Um, she was, uh, they were literally did the Scientology procedures that you would do normally when someone's about to die and you want to make it easier for them to quote unquote, drop the body. Yeah, exactly. And, and someone that they knew was in that condition was left unsupervised, unwatched with a weapon. Does that sound like an accident? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That does not sound like an accident. And yet this was not properly investigated by the police. Mm -mm. And um, it's honestly, it's one of the most disgusting things I've ever heard of. And it happened right there in Clearwater, right? Yeah. And by the way, uh, Whitney Mills was not born and raised in Scientology. Um, she was, she's not, she's the only member of her family who's in Scientology, who was ever in Scientology. Um, she, she went to, uh, she grew up here in Clearwater. Um, someone can fact check me on this. I think she even went to Clearwater high school. Mm -hmm. Um, <clears throat> and she joined Scientology because of a guy that she met. And, um, the fact that uh, she ended up getting up to OT eight partially by taking on an unserviceable amount of credit card debt. Yeah. This was part of what was leading to her emotional dysfunction or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, she was diagnosed by uh, Minkoff. What's um? What's the Doctor Minkoff's first name? Doctor Minkoff, the Scientologist. I always I want to say Ray, Ray, but I'm confusing him with Ray Midoff. Doctor, yeah, right. <laughs> Doctor Minkoff, Scientology. I actually know the guy personally. Um, come on now, what's his name? Oh, David Minkoff. Doctor David, David Minkoff. Minkoff. Um. She was diagnosed by David Minkoff as having Lyme disease. The number of Scientologists who get diagnosed by David Minkoff as having Lyme disease is mind blowing. This is the catch all diagnosis that Scientology MDs give to Scientologists who are having um, uh, central nervous system or mental problems that they cannot figure out what else it is. They say, oh, you've got Lyme disease. Mm -hmm. And then they just put them on a regimen of vitamins and stuff like this. Um, it's, it's no coincidence that Dr. David Minkoff is the same doctor who was, um, overseeing Lisa McPherson's, um, so-called treatment, Scientology treatment. Wait, and does he so, still have his license? Is this guy still practicing medicine? I, uh, I would need to verify this. I believe yeah. he may, uh, he, he has an office in downtown Clearwater. I just don't know if his office is one of these holistic medicine offices, like, uh, he he does practice. Does he practice under as an MD? Yeah. I don't know. Does he have some other certification that he got that he can practice under? Um, by the way, Dr. Minkoff is Rebecca Minkoff's father, the famous purse designer. And and also doc, um, um, uh, Dr. Minkoff's two sons. Well, his son, there's Max Minkoff and Uri Minkoff. Uri runs Rebecca's business. And Max, last I knew, was still in the Sea Org as an auditor at wow. um, the middle management building on Hollywood Boulevard in Ivar. Wow. Uh, yeah. Why, why did it go on, on that tangent? Oh, cause the doctor mink off. Yeah. Because, she Oh yeah. Was and that she was diagnosed with Lyme disease. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's funny because it was reported in some of the reports about her that she had cancer. Um, the thing is she thought she had cancer that she actually got checked out and she did not have cancer, but yeah. Scientologists started telling people that Whitney had died of cancer. Or yeah. that she had cancer, it was inoperable, and she chose to drop the body instead. Yeah. They're literally making up stories and telling Whitney Mill's friends false stories about her death just to make themselves look less bad. Yep, that's absolutely true. That's what they do, which in, in every single one of these cases is come up with their short story about it and... It just, and that's why Scientologists inside, because people ask, well, this happened to somebody who is OT8. How does that not, you know, how do you not, how does right. that not wake you up? It's because they don't know the whole story. They don't know what she tried to do to herself. They don't know that she asked for help and wasn't given it. Just like many of these, these situations. 
Right. It's just, but again, Whitney Mills, you guys can learn more about it. Go search Aaron's channel because he did multiple videos on it when it happened last year. I'm sorry, two years ago. Yeah. And I'm going to mention one that I think is probably not on your list, but since it's so similar to what happened to Whitney, I want to mention it because it was another OT8, mm -hmm. another person who'd been in Scientology, actually much, much longer than Whitney had been in Scientology. She was one of the Los Angeles area's biggest field staff members. That's a public Scientologist who recruits mm -hmm. other Scientologists, other people into Scientology. Her name was Wendy Ederix. She was yeah. one of the most powerful OT8 FSMs in the LA area. She ended up taking her own life with a firearm in a motel room in LA. This was completely covered up. When Nobody. Was this? Well, this was a number of years ago. But again, you go, how does an OT8 get to that? And not just an OT8, like an, an active, mm -hmm. an OT8 who's active, very active, considered a high producer, an upstat, an opinion leader. I, I remember all, Wendy. Didn't she Didn't she uh, get people to flag? She was a flag field staff member. Yeah. Right? I mean, she was like a mover and a shaker. She was one of the most productive FSMs in Scientology. And um, – yeah, many people may not even know what I just said. Yeah, I, d I did not know that. I knew that, I yeah, I did not know that. But I do remember her. I recall my mom telling me, and my mom was on, was on uh, OT7 before we left Scientology. And when she started questioning flag and bringing up questions, she told me this after we left, not when it was happening, but after we mm -hmm. left. She said that she felt they started doing processes on her and things with the intention of making her lose her mind. Really? Intentionally, because my mom was a very active Scientologist, and I think they could see the writing on the wall of what would happen if she left, that she would not be quiet, especially with the mm -hmm. things that she was questioning and asking about. And then when she brought up the fact of why are you doing these other things, she told me, she's like, I faked what I had to to get out of there, and I knew I was never going back. She wasn't at that point ready to fully leave Scientology. She just knew she was never going to go back to flag again. And she was convinced, especially after we left, that that was the intention to make her literally lose her mind so she would be, wouldn't be effective and feel up to, to speaking out against Scientology. Wow. That's incredible. Yeah. So they do do, they do do stuff like that. Uh, what about like uh, Rex Fowler out of Denver in December of 2009? For those of you that don't know, Rex was, let's see, wasn't he also, was he OT as well? He was OT8 as well. He was OT8 as well. Rex Fowler, Scientologist. He murdered his business partner and then tried to take himself out and he failed. And I do believe he's still in prison. Yeah, I was still in Scientology when this happened. I was friends with Rex's son, Alex. We were in the Sea Org together. Uh, Alex had already left the Sea Org at that time. Uh, and Alex was uh, was Rex's adopted son. And I, I'd never even personally met Rex. I just knew Alex from the Sea Org. And so I knew that Rex was his father. I remember sending Alex a, a message on Facebook back then, kind of being like, bro. WTF OMG. Um, and obviously, um, actually, if I even dug that up, I wonder if I still have the message. But it was one of these things where, like, no, uh, like, I think there was some stuff going on in the business where Rex had taken out a ton of debt in the company's name to give yeah. it to Scientology. And his business partner, who wasn't a Scientologist, was like, oh, hell no. And there was going to be some big dispute or a lawsuit. But in order for Rex as an OT8 Scientologist to be like, I know how to resolve this. I'm going to shoot this guy here in the office. Mm -hmm. What? I mean, that's that's mental breakdown level. That's not like, oh, he, he didn't know what to do. No, that is a psychotic break. Yeah, it truly is. And the partner was 42 years old. Uh, wow. Follow at the time was 59. And he had given... $250,000 of the firm's money to Scientology. Wow. Yeah, I'm looking yeah. at my messages with Alex right now. And okay, so. Did you find it? I want to share quick. And also during that time, 
in the days after the shooting, people who worked at the company said that it was very strange that people who were members of Scientology were really standing up and supporting Rex. And you could tell the people who were involved in Scientology because they wanted you to send condolences to the Fowler family. And then people who were not in Scientology in the company were going, wait, what What are you talking about? He murdered somebody. I just It made no sense to them. So that narrative, there was a twisted narrative that was delivered to Scientologists at the time, as always, where they did not know, weren't given the full truth of what happened. Did you find the message? Um, my messages with him on Facebook only go back to 2013, but um, I found the message where I told him I'd been declared. <laughs> <laughs> what did he say? <laughs> he goes, um, I go, hey, Alex, just wanted to send you a quick message. I just found out last week that I've been declared. Uh, it has to do with my mom, who was declared about 18 months ago. Just wanted to give you a heads up for obvious reasons. He goes, thanks, bro. WTF, LOL, weird life is sometimes. And I go, yup. He goes, good luck to you, bro. I've never <laughs> had a problem with you or Heather. And it's odd you got declared too, but I see. And I just said, thanks. Now, he's unfriended me on Facebook, so I'm not sure if Alex is still in Scientology or not. <laughs> I kind of doubt it. There's, there's no way he could be. Alex, Alex is one of these kids where you're like, how did you get into the Sea Org? Like, you don't belong here. <laughs> he was a good, he was a great, great guy, but he did not belong in the Sea Org. So I'm guessing he's not a Scientologist. It. I'm guessing when, you're, when you're, your OT8 father is in prison for murder one, you're not exactly uh, hanging with the Scientology homeboys. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, they want to they cover that up. They want to cover that up. And that was, let's see, was that two, that was 2009 that that happened. And if we go back mm -hmm. a little further to 1990, Josephus Havaneth, he spent eight weeks at the Fort Harrison Hotel doing Scientology services. And he was found deceased in the Fort Harrison Hotel in a bathtub full of hot water that was so hot that it burned his skin off. That is crazy. And this was after eight weeks of Scientology services. He had left a note on the door. He was on the seventh floor. And the note, you know, read sleeping, so he wasn't to be disturbed. He was only found because the bathtub overflowed and the water went into the hallway in the Fort Harrison Hotel and soaked it. It was still running when they found him. There was an article that uh, the Tampa Bay Times did an article, I think later, though, about it. And, um, you know, there was comparison between this and Lisa McPherson and were there similarities, what was he there for. But it, the interesting thing about this one, and when this Tampa Bay Times article came out later, many of the, at least back in like, you know, in the 90s, in the late 90s, I don't know if that has changed. They considered Scientology still to be overly secretive and aggressive but they didn't think there was any physical risk to anybody. But I think after that, and many of these things that we're talking about, it was said that the police started to take a harder look at Scientology. I just don't know if that stuck because out of sight, out of mind, Clearwater police were suspicious about the number of 911 calls that were coming from rooms at the Fort Harrison. This was back in, I believe it was around 97 or so when this article was written. And police would respond to each call only to be told by Scientology security that the call was a mistake. And in 1990, when this happened, over an 11-month period, there were 161, mm -hmm. 161 911 calls made from rooms in the Fort Harrison. But each time, Scientology security guard said there was no emergency, and they tried to blame it. Scientology officials said that most of the calls are mistakes that occur when foreign visitors try to dial the international access code. So they go nine to get an outside line and then zero, zero one, one one. But that wouldn't call nine one one, would it? No. You got to call yeah. 911 to call 911. And I think, Aaron, because we know too that you'd also have to hit nine nine one one, wouldn't you? Yeah. Nine yeah, to get the exactly. outside line and then 911. Yes. Yeah. I'm looking in the live chat because part of me does wonder if if a hotel room where you have to dial nine to get an outside line, which I don't even know if that's a thing anymore. 
if there's some sort of a default, like if you go 911, would it automatically call 911? Mm, um, yeah, I don't know. But either, but you know what? That doesn't make sense because how many people are making international phone calls from the Fort Harrison Hotel? Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, let's start there. <clears throat> <laughs> That's the thing. And there's been so many of, I used to wonder, because I remember there were times like when I had been to flag for services a few times when I was a Scientologist and I was a, a public person. And there seemed to be at certain times where they got stricter about the rules on who they let in. Not every public can go to flag for services. There are certain qualifications. You could you could have never tried to unalive yourself. You could do services in Los Angeles, but if you had ever done that, you could not do services at flag. That was a yeah. rule. And I think now it makes so much sense why it was a rule. Yeah. Because it happened. They also at one point implemented the rule that if you have any heart problems whatsoever, you cannot go, you cannot be on the flag land base. <clears throat> and um, the thing about the 911 calls, I, I, I have a suspicion that for a while, if someone was going to be put under watch, it would be in the Fort Harrison Hotel. So if you're in a state of mind where you're under watch, I could totally see people just grabbing the phone and dialing 911 and then yeah. someone hangs up the phone and mm -hmm. the police show up and everyone's like, oh, it was a mistake. Exactly. And um, what was there? I'm looking at the notes that you sent over where they, the, the police would be told, oh, it was just a mistake. And the yep. police are not allowed to check the individual rooms where the calls originated. I wonder why. I wonder why they weren't allowed. Maybe you needed to have a reason. I mean, it's like if they showed up at your house, but there wasn't, they didn't have a warrant or anything like that. I mean, you know, Scientology is not going to let the police just be going through and, and checking things out. But I think you're right. I think it was because of situations that happen and with a heart, when that heart rule came out, I don't doubt too that people had had major medical issues because often in Scientology, we're talking also about flag, which delivers the upper levels, Right. And so yeah. often, I remember this as a Scientologist, if you were in operating Thetan, I got through operating Thetan level four. And I remember being told when I had like physical things going on, if there was an issue that I just needed to do operating Thetan level five because it dealt with that. So mm. the solution was always to do more Scientology. Well, to do that, right. you have to do it in Florida at flag, or you have to go to LA to the advanced organization of Los Angeles. And Los Angeles differs in that there's not the Fort Harrison Hotel. You're not also staying there. And it makes sense right. why Flag got so much stricter about those rules. Rather than, oh, let's just maybe not make people lose their minds. You know, let's, let's I don't know, let's yeah. change something. Maybe let's make people go to doctors, legitimate doctors, real doctors, not just Scientologists who are doctors. I think this part of Scientology is something that... I suspect many of us have also normalized. So for example, yeah. like could, Scientology is so security conscious and all this kind of stuff. Could you imagine being a Catholic and making a trip to the Vatican and having to be like, well, hold on, whoa, before, whoa, 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 whoa. We, we don't just let anyone in here. Um, have you ever had any thoughts of uh, suicidal ideation? Oh, I'm sorry, you cannot come visit. Do you have any heart problems, high blood pressure? You had the doctor check you? Sorry, can't come. Let us know. Yeah. Well, you know, go back to your local church when they send us a report saying this has all been dealt with. Like it is so. It's what there's some part of me that, as a former Scientologist, just kind of says, "Oh, I understand that flag needs to protect itself." You go from what? Yeah, exactly. If someone dies of natural causes, they die of natural causes. Yeah, what kind of a church is like? Oh my God, nobody must ever die of natural causes on our property. We would never financially recover from this. Mm -hmm. Like. It's it's this weird thing, yeah. And it and, and there's also it creates also this shame because also flag is like considered Scientology's mecca. Yeah. So could you imagine as a Scientologist, you've paid for all these services, you're scheduling your trip to flag, and they're like, oh, I'm sorry, you're not qualified to be here. You have a heart problem. You can't come here. You pose a threat to us. You're a danger to us. Oh, you've had thoughts in the past of, you know, considering ending your life. 
you cannot associate with us. You're damaged goods. Yeah, we might push you over the edge. Yeah. It's like they knew it. It's almost like we, even if they would never admit that, they must know on some level that if somebody has underlying a mental health issue or a crisis, that what they do at FLAG could possibly push them over the edge. That's right. And, you know, just as you said that, it occurred to me. Scientology says that at FLAG, that's where they have the best Scientology technology. That's yeah. where everything's applied perfectly. If they actually believed that their own procedures worked 100% of the time when applied standardly, wouldn't they want all the very difficult cases to come to flag, which is funny because in a sense, they do want the difficult cases, yeah. but they don't want those difficult cases. And yeah. you go, well, wait, if flag isn't prepared to deal with those cases, why would any other org be? Exactly. Why would they exactly. want them to be dealt with at the other orgs if they were so confident that Scientology was capable of resolving these things at all? There yeah. is a contradiction there that Scientologists don't think deeply enough about. No, it's part of the mental gymnastics that you have to do to stay a Scientologist is you don't, you don't look at anything too long because if you focus on it and your eyes start to open, then boom, you're going to get sent to reprogramming for tens of thousands of dollars. Right. Yeah. You know, another one and one, this is actually what made me think of this whole topic because it came up during a live stream I was doing the other day, popped into my head so much just came up. I guess I'm the one who brought it up. <laughs> but was what happened to David Miscavige's mother-in-law to mm -hmm. Lo Barnett. And a lot of people, especially <clears throat> people new to the ex-Scientology community and new to SPTV may not know this, especially any of you that are newer out of Scientology might not know that on September 8th, 1985, Flo Barnett, who was David Miscavige's mother-in-law at the age of 52, somehow took a very large weapon, a very long weapon, and pew pewed herself three times in the chest and one time in the head by herself. So I've seen a lot of the reporting that's been done on this. And I know, uh, the, when, when you, when you hear what the, you know, the details that you just gave, a lot of people are like, Oh, she was obviously killed. Um, this, the, the investigators on this case have been very adamant that it wasn't even it wasn't even suspicious that mm -hmm. I, I know it sounds, how can you shoot yourself three times like that? Yeah. They have, the investigators have in many different places and many different times explained that this isn't even as uncommon as you would think. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm not someone who thinks her death was suspicious in a legal sense, but the fact that David Miscavige's own mother-in-law, mm -hmm. Shelly Miscavige's mother, I mean, it's the same reason I talk about Shelly Miscavige, even though she's not like literally missing. The yeah. fact that David Miscavige couldn't make his marriage work to me is like an important thing for Scientologists to understand. Yeah. The fact that David and Shelly Miscavige could not use Scientology to resolve whatever problems Shelly Miscavige's mother was happening is the reason why I think it's important to talk about Flo Barnett. Not, not because her death was suspicious. I don't, I don't believe her death was suspicious, but have I you read think, much of the reporting I surrounding her death it? Was suspicious. I'm still, I'm still <laughs> on that train. I'm still like, I'm just not totally okay. convinced. I know that it could be possible and all <laughs> that. But when you look at two, because it has been said that she was going to sue Scientology and name David. Who, Flo? That Flo was. There were oh, a couple places where I read that. And I don't know, again, it was been said, there wasn't, you know, how do you back that up? But it, it but to your whole point, is it still, if the mother-in-law of the leader of Scientology who has all of these resources at his disposal, yet she's walking away, but everybody around him has walked away from Scientology, just like with L. Ron Hubbard, the only person left in Scientology from the Hubbard family, tell me if I'm wrong, maybe I don't know something, is Diana. The yes, man had Diana. six kids, right? Six kids, uh, four wives. <laughs> <laughs> None of them. His kids either are, you know, one of them mysteriously passed away and was found in that car in Vegas. Was that Quentin? I think it was I Quentin. Think so. And I mean, it, it's just, it just baffles my mind. Everyone in that family, far as I know, except for Diana, walked away from Scientology. Now you look at David Miscavige. Everyone in that family walked away from Scientology. His father walked away from Scientology. His brother walked away from Scientology. 
his own wife's yeah. mother unalived herself. I mean, I just want to say this for the record, just so people don't understand, uh, don't, don't wonder where I'm at on this. Like, because I know when a lot, you know, when we all talk about all the terrible things Scientology does, people will wonder, Aaron, how, how are you so confident they would never cross the line to murder? And the evidence of that is all the instances that it would have been very easy and beneficial for them to do so that they haven't. Now, I know that that's not, uh, that that alone isn't evidence. The, the, the lack of doing something doesn't prove that they didn't do something in, in another isolated in, instance. But when you look at the fact that um, they never had David Mayo killed, David Mayo did a lot, a lot of damage to them. They never had Paulette Cooper killed. They never had. But didn't they um, try? Didn't the guy show up to no. her apartment and he attacked the woman who was in there? Yes. No, I, I read the book. There, there was never an attempted an, an attempted murder of, of Paulette. Um, they did a whole lot of horrible things to Paulette, but they never yeah. attempted to to Tried kill to make her. her lose her mind. I mean, there was even a, a, a moment where Paulette Cooper was like, um, uh, she was up on the roof with her roommate who was an agent for Scientology. And um, if I remember the story correctly, they were drinking and whatever. And, and uh, you know, she was standing on the edge of the roof. And mm -hmm. it's, it's, a, it's a wild um, anecdote in itself because of how easy it would have been for that Scientology agent to just have pushed her. And I go, well, what I take away from the story is that he didn't when he, when he could have. Uh, when you look at Michael Meisner, who took down... Uh, help with the FBI raid. Scientology never tried to have him off. When you look at Ron Sr., Ronnie Sr., we all know what happened there, but they never actually tried to off Ronnie Sr. R Ronnie Miscavige Jr., um, Mike Rinder, um, a Jerry Armstrong, um, Jesse Prince, Nancy Many, um, Janice Grady, Mark Fisher, Chuck Beatty. Like, it, there's a, it's very easy. I mean, how would I know? It seems to me, based on all the movies that I've watched, It'd be very easy to arrange for some very inconvenient accidents to happen in the middle of many different nights. And I'm just saying, there's so many examples where it would have been in Scientology's interest to do that. And they've, they've never crossed that line in those instances. That when we hear about, um, I get a lot of questions about Kyle Brennan. Um, we do get a lot of questions about Flo Barnett. Uh, of course, we get a lot of questions about um, Lisa McPherson of, uh, as well, of course. Yeah. Um, it's just like, it doesn't make any logical sense that Scientology would have crossed that line in those instances. I mean, even L. Ron Hubbard's own son was suing him multiple different times. And that's not the son that was found dead. That's the son who was not found dead. Yeah. So e even someone that was posing a threat to L. Ron Hubbard himself, there was never an effort to um, have them killed. Um, and none of, the, none of the whistleblowers, none of the highest level whistleblowers who have ever left have told um, anecdotes to the, to, to the contrary. Now, I saw someone in the chat say that a, a declaration from Vicky Asnaran um, in the 90s did indicate something intentional about the death of Flo Barnett. I would love to see that document. Uh, Vicky Asnaran is still alive. So if she actually had evidence that David Miscavige's mother-in-law was killed, um, I'm sorry, something would have been done about that is my personal opinion but it, i understand people are going to have different opinions i just want i just kind of want to explain why i, I sort of poo poo the idea that a, a flo barnett or uh or even um uh or even kyle brennan that there was like and we don't have to get into the details of kyle brennan because i know he's not on your list but it's like you know he was the son of a scientologist okay so we're getting into the details he yeah. was the son of a scientologist the scientologist was a flag public um, who worked for, um, I think, one of David Miscavige's sisters, or there was a there was a relationship there, and the, his son Kyle was on some sort of psychiatric prescription medication. Yeah, um, and the father was being given a lot of grief from his ethics officer for having his son, who was on psych drugs, visiting him, and the, the grief probably being you got to get him off psych drugs. Yeah. And so my understanding is the father basically confiscated the psych drugs and prevented his son from taking them. And uh, the son had some sort of a break and um, and took his own life with his father's weapon. Now, I under, I've seen all the reports about it looked like the weapon was cleaned. Uh, there was the, the gun. There was, you know, gunshot residue was either where it shouldn't have been or there wasn't gunshot revenue where, where residue where it should have been. It looked like um, the, the, the scene had been cleaned and everything. I'm familiar with all of that information. 
no former Scientologist is going to tell you that an ethics officer is going to have or order or in any way have the son, the non-Scientologist minor son <laughs> of a Scientologist killed for being on psych drugs. It's the stupidest thing anyone's ever said. And um, sometimes you'll hear language um, that uh, Kyle's father was told to terminatedly handle the situation with his son. Terminatedly handle is a Scientology phrase. I mean that, that just means to fix something so that it doesn't need to be fixed again. Yeah. And even when you explain that to people, people will go, oh, that sounds really sinister. And you go, okay, but it doesn't mean killing someone. Okay, would killing someone be a, terminatedly, uh, a terminated solution? Yes, it would be. That's not what Scientologists mean when they say it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because, also, because also, no Scientologist wants to deal with the flap, the, the blowback yeah. of having a murder or a dead body around. Mm -hmm. As evidenced by the fact of what we just said earlier in the video, flag will not even let you on the base if you have any history of suicidal ideation or any heart problems. That's now. how much they want to avoid having dead bodies around. Yeah. So the idea that because someone they had so convinced, <laughs> right? They were just having too many. Yeah. Um, but anyway, I'm just, I'm being a little long winded about that, but you know, uh, people love getting our insight on stuff and until our insight doesn't match up with their preconceived ideas about, uh, what we should be saying. But that's, that's my insight. That doesn't mean there aren't suspicious factors around Flo's death. Yeah. Obviously, there's a lot of suspicious factors. Otherwise, people wouldn't have all the questions after all these years. I'm just saying that once you really drill down, I'm I'm quite convinced that yeah. um, as suspicious as it, as it might have been, it does not appear to be a wrongful death. Yeah. There's also, if you just look at even just the number of people who have unalived themselves, the numbers are so high in yeah. Scientology. And these aren't just, I mean, we're talking about people like David Miscavige's mother-in-law. We're talking about L. Ron Hubbard's son. We're talking about people who have reached the highest levels of Scientology who are doing this. So it, it, it's whether or not Scientology directly took a weapon and did it themselves, there in my mind, there's a level of responsibility. At what point even in Scientology do you not go, why do so many people connected to Scientology seem to end up deceased? Yeah. And unalive themselves, people who reach the pinnacle, people, the closer you are to source, to L. Ron Hubbard, the closer you are to that core, it's just people dropping all over the place. And to your point earlier, Aaron, they're supposed to have the solutions of the mind to help people, to free people. But the closer you get to that, the messier it gets. That's right. It's just like the closer you get to working for David Miscavige, yeah. the more like you are to leave Scientology forever. <laughs> yeah. These people are just next level, next level with it. Now, I will say this. In my mind, one of the, in fact, for me, I think I consider this to be one of the most, the passings aside, scandalous things to ever happen in Scientology. And it happened a long time ago. <clears throat> and so many people don't know about it. I always want to scream it from the rooftops that Scientology still holds the record for the single largest infiltration into the United States government in history. In yeah. history, 136 government entities. Can you imagine? I don't know if they'd get away with it today because technology and things are different, but they, they put people in positions in the IRS, in different government entities to find files, to pull them, to replace them with other ones. This went on and resulted in 11 senior Scientologists, including the wife of Elman Hubbard, going to prison, being sentenced to prison. And can you believe they got their tax exemption back after, after that? that? After that, this happened in the late 70s, in the late 70s, because that's when it was like this big hoo-ha with the FBI in the late 70s. And then in 1980, when I was a child and accidentally body routed Mark David Chapman into the Scientology org, and right after that, he went and shot John Lennon, then the FBI came and was looking into that. It's just this whole, how we go from the late 70s into 1980 and somehow 13 years later in 93, Scientology gets their tax exempt status back. When Scientology was being run by the same people who were there when all this stuff happened in the first place. Yeah. What changed? What yeah. changed? They just got better at covering stuff up. And there are in some ways, there's this 
that, you know, they want to throw people under the bus. Oh, it was this oppressive person and they're no longer in the church. They're no longer in Scientology. They were doing that. Really? Really? Because it seems like every decade that Scientology has been around, there has been shenanigans. There has been loss of life. There have been people in horrific mental conditions, yet nothing changes. And I don't know about you, Aaron, but at a certain point, I went from, you know, what needs to happen in Scientology is reform. Things need to change. If they want to believe what they believe, they can do that. That's fine. And I still believe that people are free to practice the religion of their choice. But Scientology needs to be shut down. There is no coming back from any of this. And for me, this is something that really more recently, I kind of changed my mind about. I went from like, oh, you know, we just, if they could reform it, they can continue. Now I'm like, nah, <laughs> y'all need to just go down. This is it. You've not gotten it right this entire time. And we're just done with you. We're done. You had all this time to figure it out. You don't figure out. You actually make it worse and you double down on harming people. So it's over. Yeah. It's done. Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, I agree. Like, I have no interest in in a Scientology reform. I mean, for its own sake, I sort of feel like, yeah, they should reform. But 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 I also go, okay, so a reformed Scientology though is still a scam. Like, now I know a lot of people think all organized religion is a scam, but if we're talking about, and sometimes just for the sake of example, I just use Christianity or whatever, they admit that it's faith. They had like they admit that it's faith. Scientology runs the scam that there's this magical state called full operating Thetan. L. Ron Hubbard accomplished it. He wrote up all the secret knowledge before he died. It's in the vaults. It's waiting to be released. We just need a little bit more of your money, a little bit more of your time, just a few more of your children, and open up a few more buildings. And it, like it, even a reformed Scientology is still a con and a scam and a lie. And that's why I kind of go, well, yeah, they could reform. They should reform. It would be, you know, at least nicer for their members, but they need to lose their tax exempt status yeah. and at least be fighting the same battle that everyone else is fighting without being able to hoard all of this uh, non-tax money. Yeah. No longer have this protection of being a church and a religion. You take that away. They no longer can get away with a lot of the even having kids working, having, you know, the elder abuse that they claim is all part of their religious treatments. <laughs> It's, it's, yeah. it's just insane. And I think that that shutting it down, they've long passed reform. And when I looked at all of this in the, like the whole picture, mm. I lost any belief in or faith in a chance. And I am the queen of second, third, four chances with people that people can change mm. that they are, you know, there's good people. So for me to say this, is it really for me a big deal? I just don't believe it anymore. I don't believe they can change. I think that David yeah. Miscavige needs to be in freaking handcuffs just to start, not just him. I'd like to see him handcuffed to a bench in the LAPD. <laughs> I truly believe that all the many hundreds of millions of dollars of uh, credit card fraud, identity theft, uh, bank fraud, yeah. loan fraud, I, I do believe uh, that will be what ends up getting people arrested again. Yeah. Yep. I and um, I, you know, it's debatable or questionable whether the feds will be able to tie David Miscavige to that, but I think they will be able to. Yeah, I think you're right. It's how they often get, you know, people, you know, gangsters, mobsters. It's that whole Rico thing. They, oh, they always get you on the money. Right. <laughs> and that is the thing with Scientology. Now, enough people, too, have come out and shared the whole chase wave. The whole, <clears throat> I feel too, Aaron, we should probably do some new videos about that because there's so many more people now who are coming to learn about Scientology and why it's a cult. And this whole financial thing that went down and continues to go down, using people's credit cards. What happened to Mike Brown's mom, Rosemary, as a Sea Org member? They got credit cards in her name and they jacked them up and yeah. she had to pay for it. That happened over and over again with so many. And this is something that affected the everyday Scientologists, not oh, yeah. just the org members. I mean, I think it's pro arguably affected every single Scientologist. Yeah. Every single, every single Scientology family. 80% uh, of the money that was raised, of the $23 million that was raised for the new Austin Scientology building was raised through credit card fraud, bank fraud, loan fraud identity theft 80% yeah. every scientologist in austin has uh, been affected by that scam and that scheme there's no way 
this scheme uh, was rolled out internationally to every organization, but David Miscavige has his hands clean. Yeah. The guy who takes credit for everything that happens in Scientology, he just didn't know how the hundreds of millions of dollars was being raised. Like, please, I think he gets taken down uh, in this whole investigation. Yeah. And so many more of the people that actually did those things. Cause it's one, I was thinking about that too. Cause you look back and go, okay, it was, somebody had to run the credit card. Somebody had to do the fake application. I mean, it just, he wasn't literally the only one swiping cards there. So I think there's so much more to come out. Well, and one of David Miscavige's key deputies, Ty Webb, was one of the architects of the entire thing. Wow. And Ty Webb is still in the Sea Org, and he's still in Los Angeles. Uh, one, of, one of the LA live streamers, it was either Hellcat or Confident Chris, caught him on one of the live streams last month or two months ago. So it's like it, they're not even getting rid of the people who perpetrated the crimes. Yeah. They're <laughs> just mean, hiding them and moving them around. Right. So, Yeah. And that is pretty much like there. I mean, we could we could honestly go on and on and on. I think that between the financial stuff, I think there's more that's going to come out about that. I think that even in recent years, it's just begun to come out. I think more is going to come out because so many more people are leaving Scientology who were victims of this. Some of them want to talk about it. Some of them, you know, I I just think it's going <laughs> to. I totally agree. Yeah. And then, of course, today with the protests, I think that's the other thing where we're at right now is the biggest thorn in Scientology's side, I think, are all the protests that are growing across the world and oh, easily yeah. in our country. Every single day, there are new people showing up to protest Scientology. Aaron, there are grandmas protesting Scientology, okay? Represent. I love it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you've got the protests happening outside all the orgs. It's absolutely impossible to recruit into Scientology these days. And then you've got the effort to get every congress, every person running for either re-election in Congress or you know challenging, uh, but running for a seat in Congress. It is election season. It's March now. Elections are in November. Just the effort to get every uh, candidate or incumbent for Congress to get on the record. What is your position on holding hearings into Scientology's tax exemption and um, uh, you know really push it as a grassroots issue? Uh, make sure politicians are aware of this. Make sure they understand how much support there is for holding congressional hearings into Scientology's tax exempt status. And um, uh, yeah, it's it's a it's a great day not to be in a cult, but it's a bad day to be in Scientology. It is. Did you see on the recap today? I shared a video. I think it was in Port. Oh well, God, was it in Portland? There's a car leaving a parking lot, and the person from the car yells to the protesters, "It's a great day not to be in a cult." <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome. Yeah. When awesome. I last took a trip in November over to the UK, I uh, we flew out of Miami instead of Tampa, and I was going through the TSA line in Miami when one of the TSA agents came and tapped me on the shoulder and said. It's a great day not to be in a cult. <laughs> <laughs> that's so great. I absolutely love that, that word, word is getting out. And that's why I think, I know that so, as, as you know, we haven't shared exact dates yet, but we are going to Clearwater, my Tony and I in April. And I'm already, I'm like in my merch shop. I'm like, okay, what am I going to wear? I want like the biggest <laughs> SPTV thing that I can put together. So I just cannot wait. I cannot wait. It's oh, going to be so much fun. It's going to be awesome. Yeah. So that's what that's what I got. That's what I got for my list. We could go on and on, but I know we want to watch the time as well. Yep. I'm going to be doing an interview in one hour on my channel. And then you've got something you're doing in two hours. Yep. At, uh, let's see, six o'clock central time, I'm going to be interviewing Miriam Francis. And we're really going to get into how... She's really in, I see her as such a, a, a voice for the voiceless. Each person surge, each person who's getting the word out about how there is no room in Scientology. Children cannot consent. They should not be there. There is a larger effort when it comes to children's rights and raising awareness. And there's a, a converging again, just like with the protests, you got your ex Scientologist, you got your live streamer, you got your first amendment auditor. Worlds are colliding and coming together, and it's creating this tsunami that Scientology is not going to be able to stop. They're just going to totally be run agree. right over. 
run mm-hmm. right over. And we're going to be sitting on the beach, eating that popcorn, just watching it happen. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right. Well, this was great. We're going to do your outro, right? Yes, we are. Mm -hmm. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Please hit that like button. Hit the subscribe button as well. Thank you for being here. Get out there and have an amazing cult-free day.